Hey everybody, this is So Heidi, and you're listening to the Successful Fashion Designer Podcast. We all know that the fashion industry is brutally competitive and it takes loads of hard work to get ahead. The problem is that everyone's secretive and tight lipped about their ways. After working as a designer and educator for over a decade, I wanted to help break down those barriers and bring you valuable knowledge from industry experts, and this show is exactly where you'll find that. Whether you're trying to break into the fashion world, make yourself more marketable, launch your own label, or become a successful freelancer, we'll help you get ahead in the cutthroat fashion industry. This is episode 62 of the Successful Fashion Designer Podcast, and today I'm chatting with Claire Fuller. Claire had no background in the fashion industry. She didn't go to fashion school, and she had never worked in fashion before, but she had a need for a baby bag that solved some problems and was something she just could not find in the market. So the story does not start off different than many other entrepreneur stories where they need a product that they cannot find, and so they decide to create it themselves. So Claire figured out how to create a product how to go into production. She found a factory over in China. She got her designs ready into production, ordered a bunch of pallets, and she went to market. Now, that whole process that I just outlined sounds very, very simple, but she actually did a lot of work in between, and she built this brand, Baby Mule, up from the ground. She really engaged with her customers. She talked to people. She got feedback on what they liked, what they didn't like. She understood why people bought her product, why they didn't buy her product. And this is all starting from 2010 on. So she built this brand over the years. She continued to go to consumer shows and to engage with her customer. She sold her product through retail outlets throughout the UK. And she refined and refined and refined and continued to create this great product that people loved. Over the years, she realized that she had a passion for the design and the product development side of things. And she was falling out of love with doing some of the day-to-day tasks of running a business, the finances, the, the bookkeeping, the logistics, all of that stuff. So recently, Claire sold her brand to another company, but she has stayed on to do all the design and the development and just to do the work that she loves. In this interview, she chats with us about all of the steps and trials and tribulations that she went through, what it's been like to understand her customer, to get that feedback, to learn how she can improve her product better, what she did, very, very smart, a few very, very smart things she did to protect her ideas. Her bag is very intricately made and has a lot of special pockets and clasps and features and she talks exactly about how she protected her ideas over the years to to help prevent any knockoffs and what she did when when she did start discovering stuff like that in the market i know you guys are going to love this episode so much with claire really really tons of advice and great takeaways for anybody thinking of or working on their own brand in the fashion industry Now, a quick ask from you. As you know, I always ask you guys to help share the podcast. One of the best ways you can do that is to just send it to someone you know in the industry. So maybe you have a vendor or a supplier or someone you're working with who you think could get some value out of listening to one of these episodes. Go ahead and send them an email and let them know, hey, I've been listening to this podcast. There's a lot of really great, valuable information in it. I think you should check it out too. The best way we can do this is by telling other people to listen. So often I hear people say they discover the podcast, and the line I get all the time is, I wish I had discovered this sooner, so help people out there discover it. I really, really would appreciate it, and I know that they would too. Now, let's jump into the interview with Claire. As always, to access the show notes for today's episode, visit sfdnetwork.com slash 62. Welcome, Claire, to the Successful Fashion Designer Podcast. Can you please start out by introducing yourself to everyone and letting us know who you are and what you do in the fashion industry? Oh, thanks, Heidi. I'm Claire Fuller, and um, I have recently begun designing only for my new partner, who uh, bought up my business that I owned called Baby Mule. And Baby Mule is a very dynamic baby changing bag. For, or diaper bag for um, traveling and active parents. And it's mostly sold in the UK and is branching out into Europe and hopefully to North America soon. Awesome. Okay, so I know a little bit about your story because you and I have emailed a little bit over the past year or two. Um, and you've told me some really funny stories and some of the stuff you've gone through with your brand. Yes. So can yeah. you give us a quick 
background of like how Baby Mule got started and how you got into this whole business? Yeah, sure. So um, it is it is that cliched mummy entrepreneur story. And um, I was in project management and I have an arts background, fine arts, and uh, had my first baby. And I was literally in the marketplace thinking, where's my perfect bag? I couldn't see it anywhere. I knew exactly what it was supposed to do. I knew exactly what I wanted it to be like and what to have in it. And it literally didn't exist anywhere that I could see in any free marketplace in, in North America or the UK. So I was living in, U, in the UK at the time. So um, it was just one of those things. I, I, I had the ideas uh, and I was ready for something different in my career anyway. And uh, I put, started putting together the pieces of the, the, the concept and researching the marketplace and putting the building blocks together as to how I could personally get the designs together, uh, create something manufactured and bring it to market in the UK. And that was, um, that was, the, that was the birth of it really. Um, and from there on, it was just a case of making the contacts and pulling together everything so that I could do it and launched it. And that's what I did. Yeah, I, I um, uh, put the ideas together. I actually, for my first product, worked with a designer who was absolutely amazing. And she, I, I suppose, initially just showed me exactly what a design looked like when it was fully designed. You know, I had all the ideas and I knew how it would work and I knew how I could, uh, by that time, get it to market. But she showed me all of those design details and that um, finish and, and specifications that I would require in order to, to make it a real product. So um, so from there, um, again, it was networking and researching to find the manufacturer and then all the project management to, um, to put everything else in there to get it to the UK and then to create the brand, which is so fun, you know, getting designs for a logo together, uh, registering the IP, uh, logging in for uh, my first consumer show, uh, creating a stand. And then, as I've seen in many of your stories, you know, just literally rolling up, taking something to the, to, to the marketplace and, and selling it, which was just super fun. By that time, I was having my, I'd had my second baby. So I went to my first big consumer show in London with a three month old that I was breastfeeding whilst selling my diaper bags, which was just hilarious and so, <laughs> so fun and perfect as well, because you're there with all these other women who are about to have a baby or, if they, or they've got tiny babies in their arms and or they're excited because they just got pregnant and and you're there and you can share the story and your story with your product and then for me that was what made it so easy and so right in that I knew the product inside out and I knew the market inside out so I was really perfectly placed to then sell the product and that's how it got started okay so uh, to go into like a little bit more detail, did you really just like come up with this idea in your head and then you found a designer, got it sort of comped out on paper and, and went straight into production and, and got some got got bulk production and then went out and tried to sell it? Or was there any sort of R&D phase with working with other moms and kind of validating what you were looking at? Or what did that really look like? Yeah, there was... There was feedback for sure. It's crucial. Um, and there was uh, um, a few prototypes whereby, you know, we were getting the nuts and bolts together and then refining it. So, yeah, absolutely. But it was fairly informal. I was a very active social mum anyway. So I would literally take the prototype with me and pull it out at a baby group and there'd be like 15 women and I'd hand it around and say, got any thoughts on this? And mm. how would you change it? What do you like about it? How would you like it to look, you know? How comfortable do you find it? So, yeah, there was a lot of that, but it didn't feel like a lot because, again, I was absorbed in the world. Gotcha. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. And so, so you went into, so you did, you did, you know, some various iterations and prototypes and got some feedback from some real life potential customers, and then you kind of went to market, um, or you you went into production and got inventory went into market um mm. can i ask like you don't have to share any numbers but can i ask was it self-funded or did you raise capital or how did you really get that first round off the ground yeah it's really frightening that stage because it was all self-funded at that stage mm. um it always has been actually with me and so you know you ha you have to 
decide like, am I willing to lose this money? Because mm. I can't guarantee I, I can give it my best shot and put everything into it, but I can't guarantee that this is going to be the, you know, my big break. Um, so yeah, I was fortunate enough to be able to get a really very, relatively very small order for my first order. Um, and that helped. And being cautious, you know, I would certainly advise everyone, anyone to be as cautious as possible on those first orders. Um, and uh, and again, on that, to make sure that you can get things relatively quickly as well, because if it does work, you don't want to run out. Mm. Um, likewise. So. So, yeah, that was a that was a big step making that first order and you know, putting that deposit down and then waiting for things to arrive, you know, whole entire store, his stock load going into a warehouse and seeing it arrive on crates and just thinking, oh God, <laughs> oh, I've done it now, you know, this better work. But yeah, so yeah. Wow, yeah. so your first order, like you weren't just like housing a bunch of boxes in your, were, or were you housing a bunch of boxes in your, like your garage or your basement and shipping them out mm. yourself or did you go straight into No, your- yeah, I did not, I didn't have the space. They came in on six pallets and they were stacked up high and I had to have them in a warehouse. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was quite a large product. That's the other thing. Uh, it's quite interesting, you know, in, in retrospect, if you're going to make something, it is useful to make something that's small because <laughs> it's just easier to handle. <laughs> Maybe a coin pouch. <laughs> ben I'm going to make neck scarves. Yeah, for my next don't take up any space. <laughs> uh, yeah, um, no, but yeah, yeah. You can't put all your baby stuff into a coin pouch, though. <laughs> <laughs> Exactly, um, exactly. Okay, wow. So that that is like I'm like having this vision of of all these pallets and product. And so like right in that moment, what was your plan for sales and distribution? Uh, it was a uh, gosh, it was a while ago. So it was 2010 and the internet is very different now. So yeah. I'm not sure how much this would apply now, but then I I had my website up and running with e-commerce and um, Amazon was in its fairly early days then actually but I was selling through Amazon Mm. yes I was and um, I was selling through my website and I uh, did this big consumer show in London and then uh, I started approaching retailers and getting little orders out for retailers that I thought matched up best to to sort of my uh, products lifestyle aspirations and you know, criteria. Okay. So talk yeah. a little bit about that. Cause I don't, I mean, it, to me, it's not as simple as like, Oh, I just started approaching retailers and I got orders. Mm. Like, How mm. did they really go about that? And what did the process look like? Uh, for me, it was about finding the right fit. You know, there was a, there's a few big retailers at, at the time. There were some big retailers in the UK that they were just so huge and they, they had within their diaper bag range uh, things they were even though the store was so big they had a very specific type of bag and again it was the bag that I didn't want which is Mm -hmm. why I made the bag that I did want so I did start by approaching some of those saying look I've got this this bag it's very different it's very functional it's really super amazing and it's built to last and um but I found that they were not really interested in my product it was really hard to get into them and then so I um looked for the niche I have to say actually what I haven't mentioned I did a lot of read really in-depth researched into the marketplace. So um, I went to um, access the Mintel reports in my local library in the business section. And that was really valuable because I just looked at how much people are spending within my product category. Um, how often do they spend that money? Um, what are their expectations? You know, those sorts of reports, people don't talk about them much, but they are, if you're in a university town, they're often freely available. Or um, if you're a membership of certain business groups, you can get access to them. And they are really useful to see, you know, even within your geographical area, uh, sort of for the UK, I remember, you know, you get a, a, an insight into how much do people spend in London? If they live in the north of England, how much are they spending on this area of mm. p- your product? And it was invaluable because I thought, well, I'm not going to focus on these stores in this geographical area because there's less spend in this a- in my mm. area there. I'm going to focus more on this area of London and this area of the north, you know. Yeah. Um, and then within that, I would look at... Um, the uh, types of stores that were um, really 
high on quality. Um, so people who really preferred to have really uh, reliable products, because that was me, you know, that was my product. Or they perhaps were had a focus on travel, you know, travel with kids or um, things like um, they would have sort of beach gear or um, camping gear for young families. So you knew that they would understand the product. And so then it wasn't this uphill battle to say I've got this product it's different to everything you've got but I think you'll really like it mm. instead you can go to them and say I've got this product it really works with what you sell you know here's how it works and it's just and then if you're doing that one-to-one -one conversation a conversation not an email um, where you really you speak to the right person and you tell them why the product works for them just to make it make it real and make it tangible um that was that was how it worked really and it had to be that one by one there was no quick fix there was no big sales <laughs> strategy you just had to do it one by one and to build that unique relationship um and then you would get the little order and then you know a little while later you'd get another little order or a slightly larger order and then it was just that having that continuity was what um what worked yeah that's great. So, okay. So, sorry. Can you say again what was the name of those reports you mentioned? Mintel. I've not heard of that. The Mintel. Yeah. I wonder if they're just the UK. I'm pretty sure. How I've is seen, that I've spelled read... even? M I N T E L. Okay. I'll take a look at that. I've not heard of that before. Perhaps we have something comparable in the U.S., like census data. Yeah. Or something. I think it might be called something else in the UK. Let me just okay. see. Yeah. Um, I was curious about that because it sounds like that was so brilliant of you to really look at like in certain, you know, geographical areas, people maybe spend less or spend more. And depending mm. on the price point of your product, it could, mm. it, it's a waste mm. of time to look at certain areas. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so then you had like these one-on-one, -on -one, like you said, it's really, it's doing the legwork, like having those one-on-one -on -one conversations with the right person. So were you just yeah. like cold calling and trying to get on the phone with the right person or... Yeah, I would. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was. I would literally call them up, um, and um, if I was at a show, like a, a consumer show, and the shop was there, I would definitely drop in. But that's also tricky because they're there to sell, and they don't want yes. people bothering them. So you just have to really wait if they look quiet or if they look like they're feeling happy. <laughs> 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 then you go in. If they're looking a little stressed, you leave them alone. You know. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, it is. It's all about a phone call or, you know, a quick e an email just with some pictures and say, I'm going to call you tomorrow, you know, um, and then the phone call. Um, and yeah. it worked and it slowly kind mm. of built. Mm. It did. Yeah. And I think the the easy thing for me was to have confidence in the product being so good. Um, you could say, look, um, it, I know, you, you know, you sound very busy and can I send you a product and I'll call you next week. And, you know, you would just have the confidence that if they could just get to it and just have a look at it, then they would, they would get it. And, mm. and did that work pretty well? Like if you could get in their hands and then get on the phone? Yeah, it does. It does. But with a big product, you don't want to be throwing it out all over the place. So you, yeah. you kind of have to get a feel for how, how they're going to be, you know, if they, if they, if they really don't want to give you time, then I wouldn't certainly Sour. wouldn't send anything. Yeah. And mm. so, so that was like roughly back in 2010, you know, 11, 12, as mm -hmm. this was all building and growing. Mm. And then mm. like what happened from there? Were you ever able to break into some of those big box retailers or where were we able to take it? It was always really hard. And I think in addition to that, the, the retail um, environment, was having it's been having a tough time you know the last yeah. five years have been really tough for them and um i've always found those big really popular stores very difficult to deal with because you it's so much harder to get that relationship um so i think that is a big challenge you know you will you ever be able to just call up and say oh can i can i speak to so to so and so your head of buying for <laughs> The nursery <laughs> products, you know, they're just not freely available. Their time is so limited. Um, and I think, yeah, I, I never got great sales from them. And it got to a stage where I thought, you know what, this, this product has its own legs. And if, if, if I'm not going to, if it's not going to work out in these particular stores, that's okay, because I just need to, you know, focus on the routes where it does work yeah. and where I do get to where I want to go. Yeah. It's all, it would always be nice to be seen in those places to think, oh, I, you know, I was in that, 
that great store that everyone loves um, to be seen there. So I certainly would keep going for it. I think the, the challenge as well with my product is that it's very much based in that reliable, functional, practical, durable category, active and traveling families. And I think the big stores and the fancy stores historically were all about how glamorous, how pretty, how mm. how fashionable, and in many, t in many cases to the detriment of the actual product itself, you know, the quality isn't quite up to par or, um, you know, it just doesn't quite stand the test of time. But in, I think that that was driving a lot of consumer choices for a long time. So it was a tough market to break into. Yeah. So did mm. you start kind of focusing on pushing more online and some of the consumer show angle? Yeah. Yeah. And the, and the independents, because the independents knew yeah. their market and they were willing to, t to speak to me. Yeah. yeah. And some of the sort of more national, the national, um, you know, baby um, charities and agencies, they were great for selling through because they would often just have a little part of their website, which had a selection of really useful products for you and your baby, you know. Um, yeah. Oh, wow. Okay. So, so you built it up to, to a pretty substantial business starting in 2010. And here we are now in May of 2018. And you mentioned at the beginning of the podcast, um, you're now designing and someone else has purchased the company. So can you talk a little bit about, you know, what, how did that all go down? Like, did you get to a point where you were like, I, I want to sell, I want to just design or did someone approach you or like, what did that really look like? Mm. Um, I think when you've got your own product and you're building it, everything that, you, you know, your life and soul goes into it, your investment goes into it, and you, you grow and grow and grow and grow. And then there comes a point where, for me, I thought, am I going to put more time and more money into this and, and, and start managing it like, like a much bigger business, you know, to make it really take it to the next level where I need to have staff, and you know offices and just to become a much bigger entity am I you know is that what I want to do and now am I ready for it and on reflection I looked at what I did within the business and which bits gave me the most um, reward and it really was coming down to the design the research I still love um, uh, researching the market and all of those things that I did in the beginning, you know, to make something right, to make it fit. And now, um, building on the actual, you know, drawing up designs and actually working, um, hand in hand with the manufacturer to, to make it right. And all of those things were the things I love doing, managing people, the bookkeeping, the finances, the tax <laughs> returns, <laughs> the social media, you know, the online presence, the keeping up with the search engine optimization and the keywords and the, those things are just enormous, you know, they are huge. And to, the, the prospect of being able to give all of that to someone else, um, it was very appealing, yeah. Yeah, I um I just recorded another interview before yours and she said, you know, I wish people would talk or ask me a little bit more about like what really goes into it. It's not all design all day. She's like, I feel like I'm lucky if I get to design 20% of the time and the 80% is all the other stuff. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. I was finding when I was at a stage where I was like, oh, I really must get to work on those designs. And on Monday morning, I think, you know, I have to get to those. But there's all these pressing issues mm. that need to be dealt with be Thursday afternoon. And I'm like, you know, I really must get to those designs, you know, <laughs> because the week is just is eaten up by the administration and all of the running, you know, the logistics, the storage, the stock checking, um, organizing your next event, uh, following up sales or processing sales, you know, just the dealing with the business is, and and it, for me, I loved doing it. It was exactly what I needed at that time. It gave me everything I needed, including like this global view of what it is to run a business, what I like best about running a business. And and the the best bit for me, for sure, is research, design, um, and production. And so to have the opportunity to just do that, you know, that was that was a real um, 
like a real trophy kind of thing to work for, work towards. Yeah. So how did that all happen? Did you go out and start searching for someone to to buy the business and to take on that portion and, and to have you still be the designer or yeah, I was just I was discreetly doing it. I didn't I didn't want to throw it out there. I didn't want to uh, like open any floodgates, and I didn't want to be announcing anything. Um, so I had had some conversations with people who I thought might be interested in. Who I and it was important to me to get the right match. You mm -hmm. know, the product is is very dear to me, and I've worked really hard to make it what it is. And to get the right match was very important. Um, and it was a, a lucky break, really, that just a very random confidential conversation I had with, you know, with someone led to an opening to to get negotiations starting. So, yeah, um, it was it was a lot of luck, but also um, right time, right place, right person. Yeah. And so mm. when did the transition happen to to them sort of running the business and you doing all the design and production? Oh, it's really recent. Uh, it was just a, a, a formally. It was this February. Okay, so just like four, yeah, four, three, four, three, four months ago. Yeah. And yeah. so, how's that? What's that been like for the last? I mean, that's a really big change after eight years of kind of running the yeah. whole thing, and now these past few it months, is. what's it been yeah. like? Yeah. Well, it, it it was slightly staggered because actually, for the sort of three years previous to that, I was working with a distribution company who were small family run business who were running the business like I did. Okay. Um, but taking on a lot, not all, but a lot of the, of the workload. This was partly because of when I moved, when I moved to Canada, I wanted someone based in the UK to be right close to the market mm -hmm. to deal with all of the sales. Um, and, um, so, uh, so I'd cut, I suppose I'd mentally shifted yeah. and, and I'd, I'd um, let go of a, a certain amount of the responsibilities, um, a fair amount really. Um, but to be able to actually hand over the product to someone that you really trusted to, to handle it well and to then look at my schedule on a Monday morning and think to myself, oh, I really want to get to that design work. And, you know, <laughs> Monday morning, you're doing the design work. Oh. So that was the joy Really, that was the uh, that was the absolutely the best thing about it. Yeah, and I think also something that I hadn't anticipated that's been really amazing is to have a team. You know, whereas before you run your own business, you're on your own, and you 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 can get feedback from people around you and colleagues that you know you can trust. But really, to have put designs together and and go to your team members who represent your product who you know who, who rely on it doing well and to get absolutely clear honest feedback and sort of real critical analysis is amazing you know it's a really refreshing um addition to the process and i think it makes the product better as well because you get different people's insights based on how they know the market and they know the market really well because you know um jen who who leads be baby she is right in there dealing with it every day in the way that you know anyone start anyone with a business in the nursery industry is she's she sees it and she lives it every day so she can look at the product and go right this these are my feelings about it and this is this is some new things that I've thought about. And this is some stuff that's always been a good seller. And, you know, she puts it into this very sort of um, uh, clear um, analysis based on market conditions. Um, it's just great. You know, you just get the, a different take on the process and it becomes better, I think, as a result. Yeah, no, it's good. I mean... At the end of the day, you can't really operate in a vacuum. Um, it's so important to get like get out there, like even if it's just in your social circle, like you said, like chatting with the other moms mm. or whatever it is. It's so I think it's easy to kind of get sucked into your own little hole and mm. just do what you want and think it's the best thing in the world, <laughs> and you get into your zone. Um, but it's priceless yeah. to start having these conversations in real life and getting real tangible feedback to to make yeah. the product better because mm. everybody sees stuff that you don't see mm, yeah yeah absolutely yeah. yeah um and so you came from a fine arts background you said yeah but yeah like no real fashion or 
physical product manufacturing production experience. So all of that, did you just kind of like figure it out? And I know you said you hired a designer. Mm, yeah, I've always been, um, I suppose my skill set mostly is in um, finding results. My project management was really quite unique. The job before, before I had my children with, I was uh, project managing for a sculptor. So he would come up with an idea for a piece of public art and it might be in bronze or steel or uh, have some glass or a water feature in it. And he'd say, well, this is my idea. Um, let's make it, you know, <laughs> here's our, here's our customer. They're building this shopping center. And um, as a, as a, as sort of an arts project manager I would then say right okay we need a we need a you know one meter wide cylinder that's about five meters in length I wonder who who fabricates that how can we get them to to make it unique so uh how can we incorporate water features so I think that was really valuable when it came to designing products because um for me it was about finding solutions to problems and for me that's where my design um lies it's all about how would this work best? And I think that was the training, really. How would this work best? How can we make it so it works most efficiently? How can we keep our costs down and make it um, durable at the same time? Um, and it did translate, bizarrely, it did translate quite easily from public artwork to um, bags. You know, you're, you're looking at materials and fabric and how it's going to be constructed and how it's going to work most, uh, e work for the consumer at best. And... Um, what qualities you want it to show and um so yeah so but so, so transitioning into the designer role um i really just had all the ideas and through my work with the designer in in the early days got a sense for how you lay out how you lay out drawings and where you specify the details and um how you show um, volume and scale and um, accessories um, and that's really how how I approach design now yeah so you just kind of learn that uh, over over time doing that with her and then slowly we're able yep. to transition to doing it yourself which is yeah great since that's part of the process you really love yeah. um, I'm curious to know are what kind of or did you find any um, hurdles or anything you had to overcome because you're creating a baby product i mean i know it's ultimately for the mom but like with with regulations and lead and all that stuff there's so many mm. more regulations for baby products than products mm. for adults did that mm. was that a hurdle no no uh, for the uk it was really straightforward because okay. the um the european union has fairly set codes and testing requirements so really everything was just put through all of those rigorous testing processes um and cleared and that that's um that was it really okay. yeah okay Quite but yeah simple. i think that, that it goes through multiple testing for chemicals and dyes and and um uh, you know all, all of the components that are banned under eu regulations so yeah and so is that then, something sorry go ahead Oh no! I was just going to say, and then the, the, the strength testing and um, checking for any um, any metal le left in it, or you know, yeah, just the all the usual standard um, stuff to code, yeah. And so, was that a lot of stuff you would have your suppliers or your cut and sew facility sort of um, take on for you? Was that a little bit of a plug and play process, or were you then manually taking all the materials and and finished products and doing the testing yourself? I was project managing it for them. So I would instruct them to send things to um, the facilities that were able to give me the certification. Okay. Yeah. So I wasn't f physically handling anything myself. But yes, yeah. I was on top of the process so that I was absolutely sure that it had all been done. Yeah. yeah. And can I ask where, where did you start out um, doing your production? Was it in the UK or did you go overseas or...? Yeah, no, I uh, I did try and start in the UK. One of the desires was, oh, you know, let's make it in the UK. But the costing made it prohibitive, unfortunately, at the time. Mm -hmm. uh, I just couldn't create anything of the complexity that the product is that would be able to sell at a realistic price for UK consumers. So I did take it to China, yeah. Okay. And then did mm. you stay there? 
20 yes, years? Yes, yeah. Okay, all right. Still there, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and th- the thing that I that I find um, encouraging about China is that the production quality is amazing, and, you, you know, it's, it's really straightforward and easy to get certification from any factory. If they're good, they will give you certification to show that they are working within, um, you know, human rights um, guidelines for fair working conditions. Um, plus, uh, we, I've been doing a lot of research recently into... Um, uh, recycled fabrics and renewables and um, so some in China often in, in um, Taiwan um, or Korea um, just to get um, get some really good interesting new products going and you know the it's a global world it's just so easy to make those connections and to get a mill from one country to send its fabric to uh, a manufacturer in another country and you know yeah, it's it's just it's so easy to do these days. It would be nice, though. I'm always on the lookout for other places to to manufacture that are closer to the source and closer to the um, the sales point of sales. You know, it'd be nice to have something in North America. If you've got any ideas. <laughs> <laughs> I'm always I'm always looking. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think that, you know, I mean, like you said, it is such a global world. And on one level, those sources are out there and they're easy to find. But I think one thing that can feel really scary is like you putting your like you're relying then on a third party vendor for your business. Mm-hmm. And I think it can feel really scary to like just place an order with this factory over in China or in the, mm. I mean, I think if it's closer to you, it feels a little bit easier. But mm. when you were first doing that, did you hop on a plane and go over there and visit some places after you had done some initial phone calls or like, what was that like really diving in and saying, okay, I'm going to have you produce, you know, X hundred mm. or six pallets of these bags. Yeah. And yeah. that can feel really terrifying. Yeah, it can. It's always really nice to be able to go somewhere and see it. But I think you have to, even if you have been there, you do have to follow it up with the paperwork to show that you're comfortable with them meeting the standard. Um, I also found there was one time I was looking at using um, uh, a a middleman, like a UK-based middleman. Mm -hmm. Um, And um, I found that it, it wasn't a real, it just wasn't, it didn't feel right, you know. I felt that that extra separation actually felt me, felt me, made me feel um, less confident in the process. You know, I had to see it for myself, not to just trust this, you know, this organization that was in between me and the factory. Yeah. Um, that was just my own personal feeling. There was nothing really to, but it, it didn't. I didn't feel that it gave me any value. It didn't speed up the process. It didn't help clear any communication issues. It just. I felt put another link in the chain. Yeah. But it there might just be me. That might just be a little, little bit of control freakery in me wanting to actually <laughs> be able to see exactly what was happening. I'm literally <laughs> hearing you say this and I'm thinking to myself, yeah, that sounds like me. Like I just want to know every little piece and part of the puzzle and I want to know exactly what's going on and when and where and what the status yeah. is and who's doing what and I want to talk directly to the source. Yes. <laughs> yeah. yeah. The control yeah. freakery in me. <laughs> Um, okay, so you mentioned some paperwork and stuff with the factories. I'm curious, uh, did you look into or, or do any NDA type of requirements? Because that's something I hear people talk about all the time, especially if they have a, um, well, I shouldn't even say especially, a lot of people want an NDA for, you know, like mm. a basic t-shirt. And I'm always like, mm. you know, that's, I don't know mm. so much about that. But your product is a little bit more complex. There's a lot of yeah. a lot of pockets, mm-hmm. a lot of stuff going on in terms of the functionality. Yeah. Uh, did you explore NDAs with any of your vendors? <sighs> well, I had a... Um I went to a lot of consumer shows and a lot of trade shows in the UK. And, <clears throat> excuse me, through that I did speak to a lot of other brand owners, some of which had really quite famous brands. And I did ask the question, you know, what do you do about people copying or finding something of yours that's a cheaper version, like a cheap copycat? Sure. And um, and I went to a lot of... Um, uh, lectures on intellectual property and what you can do to defend yourself and what your rights are and what the processes are. And I did find that the the best advice I got um, was that if you can accept that 
there's going to be people out there who make a cheap version of your product. If, you, if you're good and you've made something really good, there's going to be people out there that make a cheap version. Um, but if you are, if your product is as good as you think it is, then that's what's going to stand the test of time. Mm. And if it's a fashion product, then the, the item that's copied yours is going to be out of fashion soon enough. And for them, it's a case of you're just ahead of the game mm. and you're going to just be that one step ahead. What I did do, though, just to be just to sort of test the ground in terms of testing my product, I actually I actually asked a, a different factory to copy my product to see how well they would do it just out of interest like if someone had my product and sent it to this other factory which is kind of okay you know it's a fairly good factory oh so you just so sent I, them a, a bag and said copy this uh, yeah i said i sent them one of my bags i said can you make me this bag oh. and um they made it for me and it just wasn't as good it looked really <laughs> similar it looked really similar it can you know if you took photos of it you would think yeah that's the same bag it just didn't feel the same it didn't it didn't have the weight and it didn't have, you know, the zips didn't glide in the same way. Um, it just wasn't as good. And I think that was a really interesting process just to oh, see. Yeah. And I got the costing on it as well, just to see how, how much cheaper is it, you know? Yeah. Um, and it wasn't that much cheaper either. So I thought, well, that's quite good. You know, the bag's obviously really quite complicated to yeah. make, you know, it uses a lot of fabric and it's not easy to put together. So, yeah, so that was, uh, it, it, I would advise doing that if anyone's ever interested in <laughs> copying their own product. Yeah, yeah, I love that you did that. And so did you approach them as Baby Mule or you kind of approach them as some person just saying, here's this bag, <laughs> I want to make one just like it. Can you, can you yeah, tell no, us that? Yeah, no, I just, I approached them as who I was. I just <laughs> oh, said, you this did. is my okay. bag. Okay. <laughs> can you make it, can you make it for me? Yeah. <laughs> like yeah. pretending you don't I didn't want to be too underhand. Specs. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and that would be really embarrassing if they came back and said, oh, I'm sorry, we don't do that kind of thing. <laughs> <laughs> well that'd be good for them yes yeah that's good for them they kind of got put under a magnifying glass for a minute and yeah, they passed the test for a moment, yeah. yeah oh my gosh I love that you did that and that's really oh I like felt a little relief in my chest when you said that it's like you're like it just didn't come back as good it just wasn't the same product yeah. so I think mm. I, you know it's something that so many people get really really um concerned and caught up in rightfully so but mm. I think at some point, mm. you know, you build this brand, you build this product, you you create mm -hmm. this relationship with your audience and your customer, which it sounds like you you were able to do over the years, yeah. and that's where mm. a lot of the value lies. And of course, yes. an exceptional yeah. product. It, and it takes time. It does take time. And I found that even at, you go to a trade show and 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 the stores that you want to be in that they, they're nice to you and they talk to you and then you hear that that they won't be buying from you because they want to make sure that you're at that trade show for another two or three years. Yeah. Because they want to see that you can make it before they help you make it. You know. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, what was I going to say though on the intellectual property as well? Oh, that was it. Um, one thing that I did do is register the logo and the name in China oh. because that is fundamental. Um, I have heard horror stories of brands who manufacture in China who go to make an order and they are they're inhibited from making an order of their own product from the factory they've ordered always use because someone else has registered their brand in China and is stopping them from making their own product. Oh, wow. Awful. I've, wow. I've never heard that. That's crazy. Yeah, it's terrifying. Terrifying. So you, I, I went through uh, Chinese Hong Kong based lawyers to make sure that my brand was registered in the country of manufacturing. Of origin. Okay. Yeah. Really, really smart. Mm. Really smart. Um, yeah, wow, great tip. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's so, a good one. <laughs> yeah, so other than you approaching a factory and having you making you know, a copycat of yourself, did you experience <laughs> anything in the market or like you're at a store and your stomach drops because you see a bag that you're like, that's my bag. Did that ever happen? I have. Yeah, well, I have seen brands that have a lot of. I have, there is a product that has a lot of features of my bag. <laughs> no they names. They came out <laughs> soon after. Well, not soon. It was about two years after my bag, and that's fine. You know, it's going to happen. Yeah. Um. Um. But 
And there was another uh, another thing that I noticed in that when I launched my bag, the whole kind of backpack diaper bag was it, it was not a, a popular thing. You know, it was all about these fashionable sort of extended handbags. Mm. Um, and it was such a hard sell in the early days for 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 buyers and retailers, consumers would get the product. That's why I love doing the consumer shows because they're like, oh, great, my hands are free. Oh, it's so comfortable, you know. Yeah. Um, and they would just get it instantly. But it was quite a hard sell for retailers because they're like, well, this is what our line looks like. Where is it going to sit in our line? You know, mm. it doesn't match any of our products. Um, and so, but I have found literally in the last sort of three years suddenly the market is awash with backpack star bags which is fantastic for me because it just means it's easier to get that instant kind of oh I understand you know I understand why you want that to be backpack I understand why it works like that oh wow so wait, uh, that's so fascinating because I think a lot like from the outside you could view it as oh wait no now there's all this other competition but for you you say that's actually a really mm. good thing yeah, it's a really good thing for sure. Yeah. Um, and it means also that I can go and extend some of the designs that I wanted to make for more fashionable backpacks that before I thought, oh, you know, is it crossing the, is it too much of a niche? You know, is it trying to blend in these two things and are people going to get it? But actually they will get it because it's, it's becoming fairly normal to have a fashion bag that's a backpack. You know, it's really, it's a very normal thing now. Versus, but certainly in the yeah, in the like, UK in the ahead. UK seven years ago, if you were going out with your baby or if you were going to work, you would not be wearing a backpack. If you were in between the ages of sort of twenty and forty, yeah. it was it wouldn't be your thing. You just wouldn't do it. Right, yeah. and so it can be hard to like train the consumer or even the buyer one step backwards that this new yeah. category is the mm. right thing. Yeah. Yes. Ah. Yeah. Ah, interesting. Really, really cool. Yeah. Um, I, I'd love to know, like, what are, what were some of the hardest lessons you learned over the years, you know, kind of coming from, from a non-fashion background? I mean, you said your skills Mm. translated over perfectly, which I totally get when you explained how that worked, but coming into the fashion world, like what were, what were some of the hardest lessons you learned that, that might be good takeaways for people out there listening who are coming from non-fashion backgrounds, but, but doing something on their own now? Hmm. Um, I think when you're making your own brand, it's, I think it's the amount, the amount of time it takes, you know, you're, you, you become someone who does everything very fast. I think that's one thing that I found a really big eye opener. You, You know, you have to process, you have to process your workload fast, like otherwise you just won't keep up. And I think that was uh, that's a big challenge for someone who's starting up their own business for sure. Um, well, wait, what do you mean by like process? Can you explain that a little bit more? Like, what do you mean process your workload really fast? When you, I think when you start a, up a business, you don't realize how many aspects to the business that there are going to be. Okay. And then if you're, if you're limited to how much you can spend on staffing and you want to just manage your workload, you know, do the work yourself. Yeah then in those early days, you just have to um, do things quickly. Like just very simply, you have to, you know, if you if you have sort of four hours and you have five tasks to do, you have to literally divide <laughs> up. Right, I'm going to have 30 minutes for this and I'm going to have 12 minutes for that and I've got, to, I've got to give an hour to that. And you have to be really strict on yourself to just meet those targets. You can't afford to spend like three weeks on one thing that you really should have gotten yeah. done in two days. Yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Okay, really, yeah. really interesting. Mm. Um, I think also, yeah. um, not. So, I, I don't feel like I'm much of, I, I don't feel like I'm very helpful in terms of the fashion industry because I feel I'm really on the fringes of that. Um, but I think in terms of being a brand owner and selling, I think you just have to be very relaxed and open about people saying no thank you Mm. Um, and being able to use that as an opportunity to say okay that's totally cool and you know what aspects put you off you know I'm I'm I really would I would really appreciate just understanding where you're coming from so that you can get a feel for what your feedback is in the market um, and use that 
as a positive for your next move forward you know yeah. um to always be curious about what your what your people are thinking of your product and what the reasons are behind their decisions even if it's someone buying your product and they love it tell me what you love about it the most you know or if someone's in two minds about buying it oh you know what are you thinking what what's um what's giving you doubts oh well it's like it's 10 pounds more than I was hoping to spend or you know I've already got seven changing bags I'm not sure I need an eighth <laughs> so, you know just to get a feel for where is it people are with your products yeah. um mm. or if you start to like you said like if you start to maybe hear things like oh if it just had a pocket for this yes. or a clasp for that and then yes you're at the end of a show and you're like wow I heard seven people say they wanted this thing maybe I need to look into adding this thing yeah yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah. That customer research never stops, and it's so important mm. to understand both why people buy and love your product as it is mm -hmm. to understand why they don't buy. Mm, absolutely, yeah. yeah. Brilliant, brilliant. Yeah. And I found also with retailers and buyers, you know, big buyers for, for, for retail, um, it was always really hard to accept that or just to deal with for me this constant push on pricing I felt mm. like big buyers and and um retailers were always trying to squeeze prices and it's it felt like it didn't matter what price you put on a product they would want 30 or 40 or even 50 percent off and that for me was a really tough process to be able to just find the right you know to be able to convince the retailer why something is a certain price you know to show them that it's not the cheap knockoff that they might have seen online yeah. but it's got the th it's got three four or five years of life in it um and it, it costs it it's a premium product made of premium fabrics that was always a really tough sell when and they and you know to have to deal with people who spend their their working lives squeezing people on prices yeah. in some cases that was hard you know and to be able to have the confidence to say thanks for your interest it's not going to work out for us today you know so did it's you like wind up just having to say no to a lot of those opportunities because they wanted to push the price so low or were you able to kind of figure out a way to show them and and without being because I, I think there's a point where you can come off just seeming really defensive um about, yeah you know like and and they could maybe be used to because they've got buying power they could be used to some of these yeah. these people caving to their demands but like what did yeah. you find was the result of that you just walk away or were you able to well, there were it? yeah there were a couple of really big name stores who wanted the product and i just had to say thank you thanks but no thanks mm. but they, you know they were just aiming far too low on the price point and there's no point I'd rather not be in a store than be losing money to be in the store. <laughs> yeah, and at the end, you know? maybe that's just not your customer. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah. And I think also, especially in the early days, people want to just give it a try, you know. Oh, that looks good. It looks new. I wonder, you know, they, they'll be naive and fresh. Um, yeah, and but you want to be open because you never know where that relationship's going to go. It might be that two years down the line that, you know, you go back to them and say, oh, look, I've still got this amazing product and it's selling here and there. And, and they say, oh, yeah, you know, let's give it a try. And you just never know what's going to happen. So you always want to be open to uh, future opportunities and the opportunity. And, uh, and in many cases, once you explain the product to people, they get it. And, you know, given the time, yeah. they then go, oh, right, yeah, this is really good. This is worth what, what, what you're offering. Yeah. Um, Mm. And so that's where the consumer shows really were valuable. They're so good. They just show, and in, in many cases, it's just giving you the confidence to go, I know this sells at this price. Mm. I don't need anyone to tell me it needs to sell at 30, 40, 50 pounds cheaper. Mm. It doesn't need to. And it sits, it's, this is the price. It's, this is what it's worth. It's worth it <laughs> because of the value it has. Yeah. You know, it reflects the value of the product. Yeah. Yeah. Um, hmm. so many great lessons learned and, um, really some fun stories in there, Claire. It's really, really great to chat with you and hear about everything you built up. Congratulations on building this company and now getting yourself into the position to do just the work that you want. What a great oh, opportunity. It's so fun. Thanks. Yeah. yeah. Really and cool. it's so nice to be with B-Baby now and to have 
to have to be able to see and forecast like future development and to just to have that it's bigger now you know it has more potential now and for me it's i feel like i you know i created it i i put the foundations in place and now it can uh, go and do you know go to the next phase yeah which is it it does feel good and it for, and i've got the freedom now to do the parts that i have become my favorite parts yeah yeah that's so mm. cool well you worked very hard to get here so congratulations um definitely not an overnight success like anything else in life <laughs> <laughs> exactly um, right yeah, it all so takes true. time it all takes time and Does. patience and diligence um yeah and luck yeah. yeah there is a lot of luck you yeah. know you've got to be out there and then you've got to if you spot an opportunity, you go for it and you've still got to be lucky. Yeah. But I think that, I think there is luck. I won't discount that. But like what you just said right there, two things, you said you've got to be out there. And if you spot an opportunity, you have to go for it. Like those are two very, um, uh, conscious things that you have to do. Mm, That's not luck. Yeah. Putting, going out there, setting up the booth every week, you know, talking to your customer, <laughs> getting the feedback, digging through the yeah. buyers list and calling and, and seeing an opportunity and going after it and saying, even if I am terrified to do this or if I'm going to totally fall flat on my face, I'm going to try to make this happen. You know, that's, mm -hmm. I think some of the results of, of what comes of that can feel lucky and I think sometimes it is of course there's always luck mm -hmm. involved but I also don't think it's fair to really discount all the the stuff that you proactively do to make these things happen mm -hmm. that's true it's true yeah so, so yeah. don't discount that <laughs> <laughs> um, where can everybody um. find um, baby mule products and and all the stuff that you're doing yeah, you can buy Baby Mule online at babymule.com. Awesome. And it's also available on Amazon um, okay. and hopefully coming to North America soon. So awesome. uh, if you're looking for it, uh, maybe just email Baby Mule Direct and see if you can get hold of it outside of those territories. Cool. Very cool. Mm. And I would love to end with the question I ask everybody at the end of the podcast, and that is, what is one thing people never were, never ask you about working in the fashion industry that you wish they did? I know you said you're kind of on the fringe, but it's, it's still, you know, a product that gets designed and goes into production at a factory. Um, what's something people never ask you that you wish they would? Gosh, I have absolutely no idea. <laughs> I think I'm just, I'm just, ha uh, yeah, I don't, I don't get quizzed that much about what I do. <laughs> yeah. Well, then what, do you wish people would quiz you more? No, I quite like it that way. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> oh, why is that? I don't know. I think it's just my thing and I like doing it and that, and yeah. But and that's wish... what makes me happy. Yeah. <laughs> you don't wish people ask you more about your work or your, your business or. No. <laughs> oh, wow. That's so interesting to me. Yeah. That's so isn't interesting. That, isn't that interesting? It is. This has been lovely. I don't think I've had this kind of in-depth conversation for years. Oh, my gosh. Really? It's so funny because, like, whenever I do these podcast interviews, I just, I literally am like, I feel like we're sitting down having coffee or a drink. Like, these are just questions. Like, I genuinely am curious. Like, wait, what was that like? And wait, how did that happen? Um, oh, that's so You know what's It's funny. I think that might be partly to do with being... Um, I don't know, having three kids. I think as soon as I started my business, I was having children. And now people just talk to me about my children, oh. <laughs> <laughs> which is lovely. Yeah. Oh, yeah. well, that's good. But then we know your children come before your business. So that's fantastic. <laughs> they, of course they do. Yes, of course. <laughs> oh. Well, this has been so much fun chatting with you today, Claire. I really yeah, appreciate thanks. your time and, and sharing um, your journey and all your experiences with everybody out there listening. Thank you, Heidi. It's been really fun. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of the Successful Fashion Designer Podcast. I really appreciate each and every one of you. As always, if you have questions for working in the fashion industry related to whatever it may be, whether it's freelancing, launching your label, or starting your own, uh, starting a career in the industry, every month I do a mailbag episode where I answer your questions on the show. If you want to get your question answered on the show, send it to podcast at soheidi.com. That's S-E-W-H-E-I-D-I. -E 
www.thecoachmentor.com and I will choose the best questions and answer them. My inbox gets flooded with questions and inquiries and it is impossible for me to answer everything via email. Additionally, if I answer it in an email, not everybody gets to see the reply. So the way we are fixing this is doing the mailbag episodes. Again, if you have a question, no matter how big, how small, no matter how silly or stupid or irrelevant you think it is, chances are there's other people out there with the same questions. If it has to do with doing something in the fashion industry, I want to hear it. Again, email me anytime at podcast at so Heidi, S-E-W-H-E-I-D-I.com, and I will choose the best questions and answer them on the mailbag episode. Again, thank you so much for listening. This is episode 62 of the show. You can find the show notes at sfdnetwork.com slash 62. I appreciate each and every one of you listeners out there from the bottom of my heart. Thank you. I will talk to you soon.